Hand is a little lower. Yay. All right. We're going to go for it. Cool. Thanks so much, you guys. All right. So where is everyone calling in from? You can write under the questions or the chat area. Rad. Totally. I can see everything now. The question area popped out. Yay. All right. And uh, I know folks are calling in from a couple of different places. Probably a lot of you are local to me here in Washington, D.C. or the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm so thankful that each of you have shown up today. So I thought we'd start with just a little question of reflection since this is a yoga program. And that question is, what are you grateful for today? And I will say that coming off of a cold and losing my voice and still having a really scratchy voice. I'm so grateful that I have enough of a voice to be able to go through with this webinar and hang out with each of you guys. So, so happy about that and so grateful for it. Thank you for your patience. Uh, if you can't hear or understand everything I say, just mention it under the question area and I will be able to um, notice that immediately. So speaking of questions, if you have any burning questions or clarifying comments, you're more than welcome to post them during this session. The main Q&A will definitely be at the end. And I just wanted to comment, uh, since I'm seeing some responses, somebody's calling in from Quebec. Awesome. So psyched that you're here. Someone's calling in from D.C. Someone's calling in from Alexandria, Silver Spring. There's all sorts of places, and I'm so, so excited you're here. Yay, Canada. My mission, both in this webinar today, as well as with this bigger program that I'm offering called Yoga Anatomy Academy, is really to uplift yogis, both teachers and practitioners, with a really thoughtful, wholehearted approach to teaching anatomy, alignment, and physiology. I don't think it should be scary. I don't think it should be daunting. I want to make this information meaningful, digestible, and really accessible to the whole community for the greater benefit of all. Oh my gosh, someone's calling in from Australia. That's so awesome. So to make this information really digestible and meaningful and all of that, like we, I, I want to, you know, break it down and apply the kind of esoteric stuff from and abstract stuff from anatomy to the, the Hatha yoga practice, the physical yoga practice and um, questions that people have. So if you want to stay connected in general, now or later, you can go to these three sites, my Twitter page, Facebook page, and website, yogaanatomyacademy.com, or search for me online. I have so, um, lots of, like, lots of opportunities, uh, free articles and free stuff that I'm posting, things to share, but I'll also have some other um, things available in the shop on yogaanatomyacademy.com. So here's what we're going to go over today. Who the heck am I? Why we would even want to study yoga anatomy, although I know you guys don't really need that part, so I'll go through that really quickly. A definition of the core, a review of the basic anatomy of the core, and kind of some of the common things you want to stay away from, injuries. Five essential steps to care for the core. Of course, like that's the name of this workshop. And a couple of bonus tips and how you can have the opportunity to go deeper into the study with me if you are enjoying the workshop. I'm curious to know um, how many of you guys are yoga teachers. I know a couple of you on the phone, um, on the webinar, are not yoga teachers, which is totally fine. But I imagine that many of you either are or are considering becoming yoga teachers. Yay. Thank you. Thanks for answering. So... Whether you're no, a yoga teacher or just want to practice, and um, I also am seeing that some of you guys are in the process of becoming yoga teachers, which is exciting. Um, so what you want to know to practice, what you, you kind of need to know a basic anatomy to be able to practice or teach yoga in a really healthful, thoughtful way over the course of the years. And that's certainly what I want to be able to do. If you if that's not an interest to you, I mean, I might be stating the obvious, but you're probably in the wrong place. This is really a practice and um, a webinar for people who, who want to go deeper and want to keep studying. Um, somebody typed in, is there a visual component or audio only? They're not sure their download worked completely. I am doing screenshots or sort of like a slideshow. It's mostly text. It's not that fancy. 
and audio. So if you can only see, hear me, I'm going to do my very best to explain things as thoroughly as possible um, as we go through the program. So that hopefully will be applicable. Oh, you can see it now. <laughs> Such is technology. So why would you study yoga anatomy, even if you teach yoga asana, even if that's just like a part of your profession? Say you've got this awesome daytime job and on the side you teach yoga and yoga classes, yoga asana. You know, I think eventually yoga anatomy is essential as part of that, especially if you want to keep that up for a while. Knowledge of anatomy is also invaluable to your own physical well-being and it's just vital to career enhancing goodness, especially if you want to become a full-time yoga teacher. It's also a really sure sign to your students that you care very deeply about what you're teaching and offering if you're a yoga teacher. I think these days as yoga teachers and to some extent as yoga students, we're missing out a little bit on some really deep qualities of mentorship and community. Um, although there are intensive teacher trainings that are, can be very, very powerful, you know, if you go to a month-long intensive teacher training and you're done, then you don't have a lot of continuity and, and a means to integrate it into your life. If you go to one-off workshops with teachers and, um, and, and, and learn sort of piecemeal, which, which I do all the time and I absolutely adore the teachers and learning different styles and having that available to me, um, but it can also leave you without like a coherent um, teaching methodology or style or study or studentship. And I do think that the kind of longer term or dripped information, like the teacher trainings that are spread out over nine months, they can be more helpful in creating very rooted, grounded uh, yoga teachers who know exactly how to fit it into their lives, as well as students. If you stick with one teacher for, even if it's just for a few months, you might notice a different and deeper level of progression than if you bounce around. There's nothing wrong with bouncing around. Um, but just for integration, for sustained, steady inspiration, the kind of best learning that happens within a community. And I really think that like the anatomy curious yogis will ask the best questions. And so I, at the end of this webinar, I'm going to talk to you about an opportunity for mentorship that is up in this format. And somebody writes, agreed. Very cool. So I'm just curious, totally informal poll. You can type on the side or you can... Um, how confident are you in your anatomy knowledge as it applies to yoga in particular? Basic, not very, and pretty confident, not confident at all, and moderately, very confident, eager to learn more. Awesome. So the whole spectrum is here. So grateful for all of your presence. I want to speak just a moment to that feeling of not being confident at all. Um, that's, a, that's a really challenging place to be. I, you know, I, I don't have a, um, some, I'll say this, and it will come up later in the, in the workshop, but you don't have to be an expert at all things anatomy to be just a phenomenal yoga teacher. There are teachers out there who don't know, you know, like not necessarily knees from the toes, but that, you know, they don't know like the names of those bones and that's perfectly, totally fine. If you're making a relationship and changing, um, changing people with via the power of yoga, then you're doing your job and you're doing it well. But I also think that, you know, to have a little bit of confidence can be very powerful. And, and I, I just think that kind of gaining that confidence through either a mentorship or webinars like this one uh, is, is just so potent. I think it was someone named John who wrote, can you see what I write? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I have to scroll down as I do this, but eventually I'll see everything that everyone writes. Teacher trainings do their part, but there's a lot to cover in 200 hours and just body alone, like not to mention the philosophy and the actual teaching methodology, just the body alone, you, you can't cover everything. There's 206 bones, there's 640 muscles, more or less, in every human being. And seriously, that is a lot. So why I studied anatomy, I'll just give you a little bit of my background. I started teaching yoga when I was 22 years old. 
I didn't have any athletic background. I was not the the kid that was picked for the team. I studied Kripalu yoga, which is this gorgeous, organic, freeform, and super compassionate style of yoga. And at the same time, I fell in love with vinyasa, kind of despite all the chaturangas. After a few years, I was in a class here in D.C. with a really extraordinary local teacher. And I remember holding down dog for a long, long time. I was holding down dog and the, I came home that night or the next day and I couldn't lift my arm. And I had no idea what happened. I presumed it had something to do with the yoga class. And I remember being in the yoga class and thinking, darn, I'm really tired. I want to come out of this. But I was in my early 20s teaching yoga. I didn't have a lot of money and a bunch of my students were in the same studio because I was teaching where I could take a class for free. I'm sorry, I was taking a class where I could take a class for free, which is my studio. And I found out uh, that, you know, my ego was going to be bruised a little bit if I chilled out and didn't participate in the whole class. And then that actually ended up to more than my ego being bruised because my rotator cuff got hurt in that moment. And that took me on a long path to grad school, to going to physical therapy school, which was a complete 180 from anything I'd done before. And I put this image in here because it's the scream. It's Edward Monk's The Scream. And it's a classic painting. It's kind of how I feel about grad school. Like super fiery, tough, crazy time. If you can avoid it, avoid it. At least this genre of rote memorization and really industrialized kind of healthcare thing. But I love what I do now. And I love that I'm able to integrate it into yoga, the yoga that I've always done, and the second career that I layered on top of that. So raise your hand. You can use the little, it's kind of an abstract hand symbol to raise your hand if you've ever given a clue, a cue, excuse me, (laughs) as a yoga teacher, you didn't fully understand. I see about four or five hands raised, um, actually a bunch more just coming up. And I wrote guilty as charged. There, on occasion, that will still happen. But for the most part, if you know, if I'm having the background I have has enabled me to really teach clear, conscious cueing in a way that I've never, never was possible before. I was always just kind of teaching stuff that I had heard from someone else, um, and maybe some of my own little poetry on top of it, but not anatomically. This is just a random photo that I thought I'd I'd add since we were raising our hand, how a yogi raises a hand, fame style. And then I thought, let's just imagine a world in which like all of the alignment cues that you hear in a yoga class make sense anatomically, where you could actually apply the, the knowledge of anatomy that you have and modify it for individuals. There's a, to step outside of this little slide for a moment, there's a concept out there called universal alignment cues. And in my humble experience, in my, in my experience as a teacher and as a physical therapist, there are very, very good alignment cues and there are very good directions that we know we want our body to go. But there are no like plain, basic, universal alignment cues. And the moment that someone starts to think that, I think that's one of those, um, those moments where you can your ego gets involved in it. And somebody's always going to come around. Some body is going to come and present itself differently and need a different cue. You also, you know, as a yoga teacher, have walk a really fine line in knowing when you should do your best to resolve the issue or allow the yoga to resolve the issue therapeutically or refer out to some kind of other practitioner that they might be needing. And I think that's a really fine line because Students expect a lot from yoga teachers. They just really do. I read an article today, and in this article in a really esteemed yoga magazine, the person said, "My started a statement like this, my yoga teacher finally said X, Y, Z, or finally a yoga teacher said this to me, as if all the other yoga teachers should have diagnosed her issue somehow. No, that's just not how it is. Yoga teachers are not um, diagnosticians. We're not, they're not uh, licensed healthcare providers, but there's a lot of expectation placed on them by students. And I think there's a really strong reason to step up to the plate as much as possible. And in that stepping up, know when to kind of uh, give, a, you know, refer out to, to an actual medical provider. 
Knowing anatomy straight up knows, allows me to know my limits, to see bodies for where they are in that moment rather than where they should be according to what I learned from some teacher training or some other teacher. And it and imbues a, a greater sense of confidence in my teaching that I really have a lot of value to share. A little bit more about my background. I grew up with a grandmother who taught yoga. I had um, both an English teacher and a music teacher who I was really, really close to in high school. And they all taught yoga. I got to take yoga as like a PE credit in high school. It was really fun. I was always interested in optimal health. I started teaching in 2001. And I still teach. I've never stopped. But in 2007, when I applied to grad school, part of what um, really kind of piqued my curiosity was something that was a little more intellectually stimulating. At, at the time, I felt like teaching yoga asana, teaching yoga philosophy, it, it, maybe it's just the path I was on. Just something about it didn't um, didn't feel that that stimulating on the intellectual level to me, even though physically I was really engaged. So after I got my doctorate in physical therapy, DPT, it's a clinical doctor. It's the standard degree now. I worked full-time as a physical therapist for a number of years, and now I still treat patients about 20 hours a week. I love it. It keeps me on my toes. It keeps me fresh and new evidence, fresh in the new information that's out there, and I'm constantly learning from my patients. My grandmother has been a huge inspiration. She taught yoga until just a couple years ago, and I got to say that even knowing my grandmother and how what a remarkable inspiration she's been i i don't have any illusions about old age but i still like a lot of folks in my family have lived to their mid 90s and i still want to be and i still envision myself thriving into my 90s and beyond or beyond who knows and i ask like who wants the same i think this is part of what all of us come to yoga for we're seeking that sort of eternal juice and not to live to eternity, but to really live as vibrantly as we can here on earth for as long as we can uh, in a reasonable way. And the fact that yoga is a powerful tool to help us do that is really, really cool. So I want you just to think for a moment, like, why, why are you here? Like, what's your vision? Why are you so, so curious about yoga anatomy? Because it's going to be part of what keeps you motivated to go on and to keep diving in and being a great student as you go along. Why would you want to have, you personally want to have a practice or have the option to practice yoga for life? And you can just think about this. You don't have to write it in the, in the question area unless you feel really inspired. My why, yoga just simply works. It uplevels my physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual selves. And what, when I say yoga, I mean like the biggest picture of that word. And it really works for others. Some of my students have said this lately. Once somebody said to me, every time I go to your class, I think to myself, this is how yoga is supposed to feel. It's just like awesome. That's so cool both to kind of reinforce this belief that I'm putting something good out in the world, but also like, yeah, I'm, somebody's actually getting this juice, this this same um, – benefit that I've also felt myself. A private student like 15 minutes into the lesson was like, I feel taller already. And yoga teachers hear these these great feedback, um, these this kind of great feedback pretty frequently. Somebody after, particularly after an SI joint and spine workshop that I taught said that they just felt wonderful strength and stability in their back for the last few days after it. And that was really cool to to hear. As you progress in your career, if you lose your students, you lose your money, you know, you, you're, you're going to lose students. And I can pretty much guarantee this, obviously not gambling, but I would put money down that if you lose, you're going to lose your students. If your teaching doesn't evolve on, over time, and that's because students evolve, their bodies evolve as they age, as they're injured, as the demands of their lives, their physical needs shift. For example, somebody's physical needs will shift if they have a really, um, uh, intense work environment, or if they are a new mother, or they're caretaking their elders. So we're going to hop in and go into some like deep anatomy in just a moment, but feel free to raise your hand if you're excited to learn. Yay, cute. Lots of hands raised. 
defining the core, the lid of the core is the diaphragm. Diaphragm is your main muscle of respiration. The floor of the core is your pelvic floor, which we don't think of a whole lot when we think of core. We think of like uh, Jillian Michaels or something like that. The walls of the floor, anterior and lateral, sorry, walls of the core, I said floor. Walls of the core are transversus abdominis, which is the deepest layer of the abdominal wall. And posteriorly, you've got this deep muscle that is multi-layered called multifidus at the back in your spine. So you don't have to um, memorize all of that, but you do want to be able to kind of learn and uh, think of this as a capsule. And I'm going to come up with that image in just a second. I also want to give a shout out to someone. I'm not going to name your name just in case this is confidential information, but one, one of you guys wrote, I want to learn yoga and practice to be able to move more with my ehlers Downlow syndrome. I can't stand for more than 15 minutes. I'm hoping to find something that helps. I also want to find more stability in my back. Awesome. That is such a great reason to, even just to be here on the workshop. So start thinking, my dear, about core capsule concept. The core is shaped like a capsule or a pill. This is one of the ways, one of the theories we work with as physical therapists or physiotherapists in Canada. And the lid, again, is the diaphragm. The, floor, the bottom of it is the pelvic floor. The lateral and anterior walls are the transversus abdominis muscle, which is the deep muscle in your um, abdomen. And all the insides of it are what we need to protect. The capsule protects the intervertebral discs, the aorta, fascial structures, and you want to keep the pressure even inside of it. That's a really important concept. Here's another image of the core from Grey's Anatomy. Not the TV show, the book. And you can see this is the, the abdominal wall is completely taken away and all the organs are taken away. So you're looking at the spine from the front. You can see the vertebrae and the discs in between. And you can see a couple of muscles and a lot of nerves. So as major is a muscle I might speak about in a little bit. It's not on my slides, but I'm going to probably talk about it. Still inside the capsule of the core, you've got your five lumbar vertebrae. You've got your sacrum, which is the right below the vertebrae. You've got your coccyx or your tailbone right below the sacrum. And you have six intervertebral discs. I'm, I'm kind of being generous. I'm including T12, L1 here. Um, which is just the naming of how the discs are named. T stands for thoracic, and the 12th would be the lowest thoracic spine that is attached to a rib, and L1 attaches for the first, or stands for the first lumbar spine, first lumbar vertebrae. So it's a disc in between those two. You've got your viscera, all your internal organs, muscles, fascia, majority of your just digestive tract, lots of nerves, which is kind of being considered these days in some of the more recent research as a second brain, so to speak, or a distinct nervous system. This is a picture of the diaphragm from below. And again, the diaphragm is your respiratory diaphragm. It is attached to all of the low ribs and multiple thoracic uh, vertebrae. Those are the vertebrae that are attached to the ribs. And it's shaped like a dome. Hard to see that here. It has a few structures coming through it, but yeah, I'll, I'll give you some other good pictures. This, yay, it's playing. This is an animation, like a really simplistic animation, but amazing nonetheless, of how the lungs work and how the diaphragm goes from its like resting state, which is contract, uh, it kind of loosened, but it's like a dome in that loosened state. When it contracts, it pulls the air in. So lungs have this negative um, sort of, this void, like a vacuum, where they pull the air in from the contraction mainly of the diaphragm. And so this is the lid of the core, and it's kind of constantly moving. And that will give you a good idea about why, uh, why it's so important. Here's a side shot of the core. And you can see, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but the top is the diaphragm. You can see how it's dome-shaped still. The bottom is the pelvic floor, sort of like in opposition to the top. And the walls are transverses abdominis. And the back are those little multifidi that I talked about before, multifidus. I tried to look for 
one of those equal signs that has the hash through it, so it's not equal. But a six pack or somebody walking around with this really superficially looking strong core does not necessarily have an actually strong core because you can't see transversus abdominis, you can't see the diaphragm, you can't see someone's pelvic floor um, unless you know them very, very well. So rectus abdominis, this image here is the six pack muscle. It's the most superficial muscle, and the only reason that might show up on somebody is because they have a certain amount of muscle bulk and or you really can't do it without the and a certain very low percentage of body fat. So just so you know, within the core, your discs are there. And if you have healthy discs, you have healthy spinal nerve roots. If you don't have healthy discs, you um, you don't have healthy spinal nerve roots because the intervertebral discs are, they're kind of like jelly donuts and the inside of the discs is sort of this really um, more gel-like fluid structure. And the outside of the discs is more of a fibrous wall. It happens to be weaker kind of to the sides and to the back. There's less ligamentous uh, reinforcement there. So when you bend forward, especially when you bend forward with a twist, which we do in yoga quite often, you, the jelly of your discs can actually bulge backwards or herniate into the region of your spinal nerve roots. That's a lot of information there, but your spinal nerve roots are the ones that kind of poke off. They come off the sides of the, of the spine, the spinal cord, and they come off at every layer in between the vertebrae. So when these nerve roots, uh, when the when the intervertebral disc protrudes, it pushes against the spinal nerve space and it can cause a lot of pain shooting down into your legs. Tiffany writes, wow, who knew? Yeah, yeah, anatomists know this. But in yoga, you just want to be really careful. So I'm going to offer a few ways on how to care for your discs as we go forward because that's really the most important thing in caring for your core is sort of keeping um, – I don't want to create a tear like this is more important than something else, but I think keeping everything healthy and fluid and really especially keeping our spine healthy is a very fundamental part of um, being able to stand and sit and participate in life for more than 15 minutes like that person wrote earlier. So some different things increase the pressure in the discs bearing down, including coughing, sneezing, pushing out to defecate. Side note, really good digestion is a great way to take care of your back. It's, 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 it's a fundamental piece of back care. When you are in a position of spinal flexion, which in yoga we often just call forward bending, uh, and particularly when you're in a forward fold or forward bend that has some added load to it. I use a backpack a lot of the time, and I ride a road bike a lot of the time. So when I'm on the road bike, I'm hunched forward a little bit in a forward fold. I almost can't avoid that position on the road bike. And on top of it, I have my backpack on. So I have some added load outside my body. But another um, position that you can imagine, so I'll just say this in the English word, if somebody is uh, practicing Ashtanga yoga and they put their foot behind the head, the spine comes into a nice rounded shape there, a forward folded shape there. And they've got that added load of the extra weight of the leg curling the spine forward even more. So there are these things that we do. If you're in those positions and then the pressure is increasing on the discs, it can cause a lot of long-term problems and pain. So we do various kinds of crunching or active spinal flexion in yoga. And I'm not putting this as a list of bad things to avoid. I'm putting this out here as a list of things to really be conscious of that we do that could cause some disc bulging or herniation. Bakasana and a number of other arm balances where we're sort of positioning the legs somehow on the arms uh, inevitably involve a really rounded spine. Halasana or plow pose as well as karna pidasana which is the ear pressure pose kind of the evolution of plow pose to knees by the ears. Sasangasana, or rabbit pose. Uttanasana, which is just the simple standing and forward folding. Unless someone has particularly open hips and hamstrings, they may not fold that easily forward. And you'll often, even in people who do, you'll see some rounding in the low back. 
Again, there's nothing like inherently awful about the rounding itself, but the if the pressure were to spike in those positions, it could cause some pain. Seated forward fold positions like Marichasana B, which is pictured here on the right. And even, like let's say you're teaching a super gentle class, really limited range of motion, just getting up from lying flat on your back to a sitting position, unless you do it in a log roll shape, like rolling to your side, pushing up really nice and steady, you're doing a little bit of a crunch, so to speak, or an active spinal flexion. I already talked about some of the injuries that can result from that spiked intra-abdominal pressure, the herniated disc, the bulging disc. You can also get an inguinal hernia, which is like a hernia in the groin, or uh, sometimes even SI joint issues or pelvic floor issues. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. If you have any questions, this is a great time to ask. Because we are about to start the five essential steps to caring for your core. Because a lot of that was just background. And the first step, this one I'm really, really passionate about, is full diaphragmatic breathing. Hopefully, you're already doing this. As a yoga lover, you're already here and enjoying this. But full diaphragmatic breathing is so good for you in so many ways. In so many ways, it stimulates your vagus nerve, which allows you to feel like you're calmer, more in a state of tend and befriend as, yeah, instead of fight or flight. It massages and keeps everything supple inside your abdomen, including your digestive system. So it sort of creates this pulsing um, on and off pressure that allows your your digestive system to work more efficiently and smoothly. And when diaphragmatic breathing is done correctly, it helps to maintain good tone of the pelvic floor, which is essential for being able to, gosh, even just control your bladder function as you age. I thought we would pause for a moment to do a little bit of a breathing pelvic floor exercise. Someone asked, are you going into the gut-brain connection more? And this is not probably the place where I'm going to be, where I would go into that a whole lot. Um, this is more like a musculoskeletal uh, take on the core itself and a bit of a preview to the yoga anatomy mentorship, like the bigger program that I'll offer. Um, but if you're interested in that, I'd be, I think it's a really great topic and maybe I'll write a blog post on it. So thank you for that idea. The pelvic floor breathing exercise I thought we'd do is pretty simple and it's, it would really be best to do this lying on our backs, but I thought that maybe we could just do this in seated just for a few rounds of breath. So take a comfortable seat. Please close your eyes and place your hands on your low abdomen. I'd like you to inhale and exhale. If you're congested like I have been the last couple of days, feel free to inhale and exhale through the mouth. But as you inhale, get a sense of broadening and relaxing around your torso, around the abdomen. You should feel some movement under your hands. The breath moves in in like 360 degrees inside of us. It's so cool. It goes forward, it goes back, it goes side to side, it goes up and down. The lungs are just one of the coolest organs if we could rank them in coolness factor. So deep breath in. As you exhale, you'll notice a softening, kind of a, almost a contracting of your belly back towards the spine. And with your next few inhales, I want you to imagine a widening of the pelvic floor. As you exhale, feel the pelvic floor tone a little bit. It's not a contraction, but it's a returning to its original state. As you inhale, the diaphragm pushes down, massages the contents of the abdominal organs, the abdominal area. The pelvic floor widens. So the two function a little bit like a piston. Diaphragm goes down, pelvic floor broadens. Pelvic floor contracts as the diaphragm uh, retreats. It's 
spend two or three more breaths moving in this way, just breathing in this way and imagining the widening of the sitting bones as you inhale and a relaxing, toning as you exhale. Open your eyes, if you haven't already. Thank you for doing that with me. I'm actually going to go back a slide because I want to make sure that this all really makes sense to you. And somebody asked a question, which I'll get to in just a moment. So full diaphragmatic breathing involves the pelvic floor because of that piston action. Raise a hand if you could feel that kind of happening. The top of the capsule pushing down, bottom of the capsule broadening, and then the opposite action. Okay, I'm seeing about three or four, just a handful of hands raised. <laughs> there we go. Lots more hands just got raised. I know that's not, um, it's a little bit abstract and not everybody felt it, which is totally fine. But uh, keep playing with that idea, especially as you meditate a little bit, you could play with that idea. And I'm going to go into more of why that's really important in the next slide. So Mula Bandha is a muscular contraction and or an energetic contraction of the pelvic floor muscles, the bottom of our core capsule. And for every moment of Mula Bandha, that really tight, contracting muscular activity that's happening at the pelvic floor that is particularly energized and, and utilized and cued in certain forms of yoga. Um, I hear it a lot in Ashtanga, and you hear it a lot in like just uh, a lot of the more athletic types, like arm balancing, things like that. So Banda is lock, upward lifting. Mula is root, this upward lifting of the root of the spine, the pelvic floor. And I would suggest that this be activated on the exhale more than the inhale. And that the movement is performed, but then for every quote unquote minute, it's really just a moment because hopefully you're not holding it for a whole minute. For every quote unquote minute that you're holding Mula Banda, this energetic pelvic floor lift, that there's at least two minutes of conscious relaxation of the pelvic floor. It can be done in the form of meditation like we just practiced or even during Shavasana if you have a very athletic yoga practice. And the reason for this is because too much mulabandha can like pull on the sacrum and it can pull on other attachments uh, in the pelvis and it can throw off the entire energetics and muscular stability of the core capsule. When the pelvic floor tone is off, the whole capsule gets compromised. It can lead to SI joint issues. It can lead to painful sex. It can lead to bowel or bladder changes or con control. Um, and then one thing that can happen really frequently with too much tone in the pelvic floor is called, I think it's called urge hesitation. So you go to the bathroom and you got to pee really badly, but you sit down if you're a woman and it takes you a while to let it out, 30 seconds, maybe even a minute or two minutes to relax enough to be able to get at least some of your bladder emptied. And that can be because of too much tone. So too much of a good thing, too much mulabanda can really be a little bit counterintuitive. Along these same lines, somebody writes that their sacrum creaks when doing side bending asana, like extended side angle, and happens to be sore today. Well, I can't tell you what might be going on exactly, um, especially because the sacrum itself, like it would probably be more the SI joint that that's creaking or popping, or maybe even the hips. And you, I'm a huge fan of physical therapist, and I'm a huge fan of really um, seeing somebody who is is familiar perhaps with yoga or perhaps with mind-body techniques, but seeing somebody who has a little bit of a specialty, who has something that they're really especially passionate about, um, and that tends to lead you to a better practitioner. And for a physical therapist, if you can see somebody who treats patients one-on-one, -on -one, that can be a really powerful, powerful way. So looking again at some of the um, the responses here, somebody wrote that they didn't feel the pelvic floor stuff. Totally okay. Totally okay. I don't expect everybody to feel it on the first time. Um, 
just know that's pretty normal too. Going on to my third tip for um, for how to keep the core really healthy. So we talked about the top of the pelvic, uh, top of the core capsule. We talked about the bottom of the core capsule, which is pelvic floor, and the relationship of those two together, right? And how they need to be moving in tandem. Well, we also want to move really slowly and be able to juice the transitions, to be able to see our transitions in yoga asana from, say, warrior one to warrior two, if you teach that transition. And to be able to see the spaces in between the transitions as vital themselves. Moving slowly through yoga asana encourages stability in your whole range of motion. I think a lot of times, not just in yoga asana, but in life in general, we sort of plop down on the couch because it's at the end of the day, the legs are tired. We don't really feel like going through a slow squat to sit down. Um, and we move through momentum. This is totally because we're smart and we're efficient and our brains function in this phenomenal way to increase efficiency in the body. But unfortunately, that can sometimes cause compensation. So there's nothing wrong with fast yoga, but if you want to have a really steady, anatomically sound, incredible practice that builds strength through the whole range, you also want to move slowly. You want to be able to move slowly from one one pose to the next. And I think that this is really where you know where we can reveal a lot of compensations in the body. Moving slowly also improves our balance and it increases the challenge for your muscles. And if you consider the transitions themselves as important as the poses, I believe you will get a lot more. You'll be sweating a lot faster and not because sweat is some great thing that we need to glorify, but because the challenge is there. We often move in our bodies in ways that are really, really easy for us. Like for someone who backbends easily, the, you look at their Instagram feed and it's all backbending pictures, right? Someone who has uh, who was born coming out of the womb doing the splits, they're in their splits in, in a lot of their pictures or a lot of what they do or what they teach sometimes. Teachers tend to do this as well. Where we need to go are the places that are really hard for us. We often, many of us, need like deep core work. We often, many of us, need to hold poses for longer because that's what's challenging. Um, so consider this as just medicine, going into the places where the prana is not as vibrant, not as strong. My fourth tip for the core to engage to if you use this technique of like lengthening your spine, it's like a uh, your mom or grandma or somebody always probably said as you're growing up, like fix your posture. It's sort of the yogic version of this, how to care for your core. Really have a really long spine. Don't just jut out your ribs like you can see me in this picture here on the right. Get taller without any kind of back bending. Think about lengthening in the thoracolumbar region, which is where your low ribs meet your low back in the back of your body. And engage transversus abdominis, this innermost wall that becomes the front and sides of your core capsule. Let this become your default and it will make you sturdier and stronger and it will create better force uh, transmission as you hit the ground with your foot. There are reactive ground forces that come up through the ankle, through the knee, through the hip, through your spine, through your core, and out even through your head and your hands. So those reactive ground forces they're they're going to have the most impact in the part of the body that's the quote unquote weakest link, and for many people that's the low back just because it's such a fragile place. So get taller without back bending. A little note about this picture on the side: when you stand like this with your hands up and out, Elena Brower, this uh, incredible teacher based in New York City, she calls this awesome pose. And believe it or not, there's actually evidence that shows when you're not feeling confident, this, this is a shout out to whoever doesn't feel confident in their yoga teaching in general or their yoga anatomy, you can actually just stand like this in the bathroom for about um, 30 seconds before class. And it has been scientifically shown, I'm not making this up, to change your physiology and increase the good stress hormone level in the body so that you feel revved up and ready to go and confident. It actually can increase your confidence. Kind of a funny side note. I love it. Awesome pose. There I am doing it on a stand-up paddleboard in Guatemala, which is the best. 
And the last, not the last, but second to last thing that I'm going to talk about today in terms of ways to care for your core kind of goes back to something I've already said, which is just pay attention to the pose in which you're really rounded in yoga. I mentioned earlier that there, it's not to vilify those poses, but to really think about them in, in a conscious way of core containment. So you want to draw in from the belly rather than just crunch, rather than like take the space between your low ribs and the top of your hips and just make them try to get closer and closer and closer together. That's going to create some major stress on your discs. Instead of making your body really compact and crunching in the front, try drawing in and lengthening the front and the back of the body, kind of like if you had to stretch a canvas out over a frame. It's, it's a really cool thing to think about. And uh, you can see in this picture on the right that my spine is rounded, that I'm in this forward fold in my lumbar spine, and my knees are up on the kind of towards the armpits for bakasana, but that, but I, you can't see this. No one can see this. But I'm drawing in. Promise, I promise you, I'm drawing in from my belly really fiercely to engage transversus abdominis, rectus abdominis, and these more superficial muscles of the quote unquote core, not the core capsule, but the core. They're still kind of in that zone, right? They are also engaged. The obliques are also engaged, but. The main muscle and the initial muscle that's happening is transversus abdominis. No bearing down, no crunching. A couple of other things that I wrote on the side that just to remind myself to speak about. V-ups, which is sort of like a, a gym rat kind of uh, activity that you could do. Not that dissimilar to something I've seen in some of the vinyasa yoga classes, moving from navasana to ardha navasana, where you're kind of lying almost flat to the floor, but just hovering your legs and your upper body and then up to Navasana, also known as boat pose. Navasana is sometimes called a core pose, but honestly, it's just a hip flexor pose. So you're activating your hip flexors, which is so as. I mentioned it so many slides ago, it would really um, take me a long time to go back and pull that picture up again. So I apologize for not putting it in here a second time. But so as is the main uh, hip flexor that's activated in Navasana. And you can engage the same principle that we, I just talked about in these forward folding poses in the poses that require a lot of hip flexion. I really, really recommend it. Like if you're standing and lifting your leg for hasta parangustasana, which is hand to foot pose, or if you're lying on your back and doing leg lifts of some sort or leg lowering of some sort, which kind of works the hip flexors in a, what's called an eccentric or negative pattern, then you can also engage transversus abdominis you might not get as much movement. You might not uh, be able to lower your legs as close to the ground, for example, but you'll have greater integrity in your spine and you won't be pulling on the intervertebral discs to get to where you want to go. So setting aside the ego a little bit and coming back to just really what's, what you feel in the body, full engagement at all times, so powerful. So the bonus tip I really wanted to put in here is something that I feel super, super passionate about, which is strengthening the hips as a way to keep everything stable, especially in your core. The first thing that hits the floor, as I talked about earlier, is really the, the, um, the foot and the leg, and then the forces of that impact transmit up. You can really think about it in terms of a runner, but a run, running is just maybe seven times the impact of walking. Walking still has impact. Standing on one foot still has impact. So these ground reaction forces, we have to be able to absorb them in our bodies and really strong, stable hips are going to allow this to be possible. A couple of the muscles around the hips that are very important, gluteus maximus. Side note, a lot of times in yoga classes, you hear yoga teachers say, soften your glutes here in a back bend. That is one of the cues that I find really controversial. I actually don't think is often, um, is often a very good cue. I imagine there are times where somebody could just be clenching and not using the other muscles they need. But whenever your hips are, are um, to some extent neutral, but de definitely if they're behind the plane of your torso, right? Like if you're standing, you think about that classic Beatles album, um, Abbey Road, where they're crossing Abbey Road, and they have these long strides in their legs. You can think about that one leg that's in back. 
being behind the plane of the body. Lots of yoga poses put us in this position, cobra, uh, upward facing dog. And you have to engage gluteus maximus if you're going to go into hip extension in that way. Um, that's a whole other topic, so I won't like go on a huge side note to, to get through that, just to honor your time. But I, these guys have to be engaged in the yoga practice. Gluteus minimus and medius also really, really important to engage for things like half moon, which I'm in on the picture on the right. You need stability there. This pose on the right can either cause like creaking and grinding and wear and tear on your hip joint, or it can be a super powerful stabilizing pose for that same joint. A lot of times the medicine is a cure, right? And when, or the poison is a cure, I should say. I think that's the phrase, <laughs> getting, getting all my phrases mixed up. So when, you, when the poison is a cure, you, doing too much of something can cause problems. Too much yoga can cause problems. Any yoga pose, even Tadasana, if you're hanging out in your bones, kind of like slumped over a little bit in Tadasana, that can harm you. If you're fully engaged in really using this shape as a form to kind of build strength and the column of support in your spine, Tadasana can be a powerful tool that helps lift you up. A couple other things in the hips that we don't pay enough attention to, in my humble opinion, in yoga, the hip external rotators and internal rotators. Just be super careful when you're going through transitions, and you can choose the flow like I mentioned earlier. Focus on the transitions between one-legged poses and two-legged poses. See how slowly you can go, how much control you can build, and you might be really um, surprised and amazed at the strength that you build or the strength that you have to build. Somebody wrote, which muscles are those? And John, if you could clarify uh, what exactly you're talking about, I'll do my best to answer. As he's writing, um, I wanted to say that, you know, the muscles are on your hips, these internal rotators, external rotators, a lot of them connect to your sacrum, to your pelvis, and they're just really fundamental to lumbopelvic stability and core stabilization. So super crucial. External rotators and internal rotators. Well, there are a ton of external rotators and internal rotators. Uh, one of the more famous ones is piriformis, but there's also obturator internus, internus, hamelis, there's the um, quadratus femoris. There's quite a few of them, and some are, are more subtle and some are, are bigger. Piriformis at some angles is an external ro rotator and actually at some angles does aids a little bit in internal rotation. So it starts to get pretty complicated down there. Um, so I'll just lump them for simplicity's sake into hip external and internal rotators. So just to summarize those five tips, diaphragmatic breathing, so, so crucial for core care. Relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles, just as important or depending on your perspective, maybe even more important as the contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. The consideration of the transitions as equally, if not more important as the poses themselves, just moving slowly for the greatest challenge and safety. Lengthening through your spine, through transversus abdominis, and then engaging the front body in transversus abdominis whenever you're rounding through the lumbar spine or working active hip flexion. And then of course the bonus tip I gave on stable hips. This is a picture on the right of uh, myself and this guy, Jack Cuneo, who is a phenomenal yoga teacher out in Denver and Boulder, Colorado. If you're ever out there, I highly encourage you to take his class. He is just a huge inspiration. Um, and a lot of how I know him is, I, I've met him in person, obviously, but I mostly have gotten to know him online, just watching what he posts. And I, I adore him. He's great. So. The good news, as I mentioned earlier, you really don't have to be an expert at everything. I think yoga is so powerful and teaching yoga, it mostly does the work for us, right? As a yoga teacher, if you get the opportunity to connect with students and to see them as human beings and to like make these relationships, you are, you're doing your job. You're an extraordinary teacher if you can see everyone's humanity and connect and help reveal more of that for themselves. The photo on the right is again from Guatemala, from Lika Titlan, from a retreat I read I led last year, and I'm leading again this year. And this student, Megan, was just a complete joy and a huge, hugely 
um, powerful person, but I honestly don't think she knew how powerful she was and how strong she was. She definitely had a mythology at the beginning of that retreat that she wasn't that strong. So a lot of what I taught her was that she was stronger than she knew. And, you know, when she started to believe it, it didn't happen on day one, but when she started to believe it around day three, things kicked in and her whole practice transformed. Things happened that she did not believe she could do before. And I think that's one of the, one of the miracles of asana is that it, it's not the, the practice of yoga is not entirely asana, but if you can, um, you can start to open your, your widen your capacity, your sense of what you're capable of as a human being within what you do on the yoga mat. It has reverberations throughout your life. And that's, that's our job as yoga teachers, right? Is to really help people to um, be as broad and as loving and as capable and as kind as they could ever be. So it's, kind of a relief in that way. You don't have to be a total expert. You don't have to know all the internal and external rotators of the hip. I do think you need a couple of good tools to be a consistently good yoga teacher, in addition to, you know, that capacity to connect. And I do think that anatomy is one of them, which I already talked about a lot, so I won't go into that again. And in the support of that effort, I have a program that I'm offering that I would love if any of you guys could participate in. So I'll talk to you about that. But if you if you have any questions related to anatomy, just feel free to write them on the side. So I'm going to click to the next slide, and I'm going to um, start talking about my signature online mentorship program. But meanwhile, Joan wrote, can you give an example of how to cue an asana that tells students when to engage the hip of internal or external rotators? Yeah, so I'll give a really simple one, actually. If you're sitting in Baddha Konasana, which is soles of the feet together, knees wide, kind of diamond shape legs, you can engage the external rotators by sliding your hands under the outer side of your knees, and pushing your knees down towards the floor, and your hands into the knees like you're trying to pull the knee up. That's a great way to create some stability in the external rotators. And if you think about the shape of the knee, excuse me, the shape of the body, the hip at that that particular angle, it's kind of similar to, let's say, like warrior two. Uh, abduction and external rotation are often coupled together. So in warrior two, you want to look at the direction of the thigh bone, move it a little bit out towards the pinky toe side. That's your external rotation. And also your abduction, kind of the two of those actions happening at once. So I hope that answers your question, Joan. Thank you so much for asking. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, I could write and talk a lot more about those. Maybe I'll do a whole other webinar in the future on internal and external rotators of the hips because that's, again, something I'm super passionate about. But to go on a little bit, the the the... The website I created is yogaanatomyacademy.com. I had this vision last summer, and somehow the last six months have just sped by, and suddenly the mentorship is about to start on Thursday. But the signature online mentorship is something I really think is missing in the yoga community these days, sort of the support network for teachers to learn conscious anatomy in a, like a really, um, really relevant and content-dripped way, where they also have a community of people who are all sort of in the mud together, um, in the dirt together, learning this material so that we can all support one another in the process. I think it's an awesome opportunity to accelerate the process, becoming a phenomenal or great yoga teacher. And I really think it's going to be a very powerful program where we're going to go into a lot of deep, nuanced anatomy, kind of like some of the stuff I talked here, I talked about here. You, you don't hear that often about the core capsule and the piston concept of breathing, but that's really, really powerful stuff that can keep you healthy for a long time. And I want to make this program super meaningful for anybody who participates. And since it's the first round I'm, I'm, I'm teaching it, I think it's going to be super, um, super helpful for the students who are in it. And those participants are also going to shape the program quite a bit. 
It consists of 10 live webinar modules, kind of like what we did today. This is sort of a preview. And weekly calls. I just added this, like uh, this, this option a couple of, maybe even a week ago, because I know that not everybody can make it at the time I set for the live live webinars. But for the weekly calls on Sunday evenings, it's going to be a great opportunity to, to check in. They won't be every single week, but they'll be most weeks where we'll check in. We'll just do like a, a kind of a conference call situation, ask questions and get, get an, another opportunity to integrate what we learned from the webinar that week. All of the webinars and recordings are going to be super, um, super available forever. So the recordings and the webinars are yours to study forever. I'm going to give kind of indefinite access to to the mentorship area on Yoga Anatomy Academy to anybody who signs up now. That includes as I add more, as I refine more, as it hopefully gets better and better as time goes on. There's also weekly PDF handouts and quizzes, access to articles and more. There's a small group community that's going to be participating, 24-hour access to private Facebook and online member forms, including me, so that I can answer. Like That's part of the, the package is that I'll be able to answer any of your questions. Uh, although there is about a week and a few days that I'm going to be away for my retreat that I won't have a lot of access to the internet, but I'll do my best even during that time. And the whole thing is more than 20 hours of continuing education credit for Yoga Alliance, which I'm super psyched about. And I know a lot of teachers will be psyched to hear that. I saw, I'm seeing from Richard a question on point number five of the five essential steps to care for your core. What was I saying about good or not good? I like doing boat pose and I feel the strength of it. That's awesome, Richard. My point is more that you can do Navasana with um, with core engagement or you can do it as a hip flexor pose. And I think that it's a little bit of false advertising because I've been to a lot of yoga classes where teachers will be like, let's, let's just work on our core and we start with Navasana. It's false advertising because unless you're specifically engaging transversus abdominis, which is the muscle that forms the walls, the front and sides of your of your uh, abdominal walls, then you're not really engaging your core there. If you're rounding your spine, you might be engaging rectus abdominis a little bit. But again, that's the superficial core, and it's not really the part of the core that is the most therapeutic to access. So if you draw your belly in and you lengthen your spine, kind of like that, that cue that I talked about lengthening the spine, I think that was number four, but you apply that to these rounded poses or these hip flexor poses like Navasana, then you'll get a lot of um, a lot more core engagement out of it than if you just do pure Navasana. I hope that clarifies your question. And if it didn't, let me know. So psyched for those of you who are already joining. Somebody just typed in that they were, they were really looking forward to the membership. Thank you so much. Thanks for... Thanks for sticking around as long as you have for the webinar. Just to talk a little bit more about the value of the mentorship program, I think it's one of its kind. I know there are other anatomy programs out there that are led by yoga teachers, but I think it's kind of special that I have this background in as a physical therapist, as a doctor of physical therapy, that I'm actively treating patients and that I... Um, I'm kind of constantly in, in this detective mode to help heal musculoskeletal injuries because that's what I do for a living. And then I'm also really up on the latest evidence and the evidence-based conversation around what this is. So hopefully that adds value. I really think it does. The cost of it is less than 50 bucks a week. The total cost is four, $4.97 um, for the 10-week program, but it's actually spread out over 12 weeks. So you'll get a lot more access in just even 10 weeks. And there are two live sessions most weeks, as I already mentioned, tons of bonuses. I'm going to be throwing a lot of stuff your way if you join and the community support, which I think is going to be a huge piece of it rather than just like buy a box set of DVDs and force yourself to sit down and watch them. Um, and if you teach yoga or if you practice yoga, which I think everybody does, you'll also get to really apply it like in real time what we learned that week, you could teach to that subject and or just apply it to the kind of standard teaching that you already do and see how it goes. 
and I come back with questions. Like it's, it's pretty exciting to me personally. Um, there's a money back guarantee. I wouldn't want anybody to walk away feeling like they didn't get their value out of it. And so there's a 21 day money back guarantee. As long as you've done your like homework, completed the downloads, et cetera, and really tried and participated, I would ask that just anybody who uses this option, use it with integrity because there's a lot of hard work that's gone behind, gone into this, including God, I was in school for nine and a half freaking years. Way too much for anybody, <laughs> at least in my humble opinion. It was a lot of work. And so just use that option with integrity. But I want to say that that is totally there. Um, I think I have the link in here in one of those upcoming slides to the program. But I just wanted to say that you, there, to offer a bonus to anybody who sat through this webinar with me, you get some extra love. I'm creating a whole sequencing module that you are going to be the first to get access to, meaning like no one else in the program is going to get that particular sequencing module. I'm going to um, probably eventually create its own, create it as its own program itself. Because a lot of teachers maybe don't need to don't need to or feel too intimidated to learn all the anatomy, but they still want to know how to sequence like like in a really incredible and meaningful way. And so I'm going to be um, putting that together and you get to do it uh, first, basically. So I have a bunch of folks signed up, a lot of folks in the DC area that I'm so excited about. And here's the link right at the bottom. There's no way to make that link live, which I apologize about. But that's it, yogaanatomyacademy.com. You can um, get to it under the shop tab, or you can type out the whole thing, slash product, slash yoga, dash anatomy, dash mentorship. I am wondering if anybody has any questions on the mentorship. Somebody is saying they'd like to join with the payment plan and make your first payment on Thursday because Thursday is the starting date. Um, and yay for the sequencing module. Yay. Awesome. Well, we would love to have you. I would love to have you in the program. There is a payment plan too, and it's not exactly at the same page uh, for technical reasons. I, I have it on like a different page, but there's a link to it on that page. So if you go to yogaanatomy.com slash product slash yoga dash anatomy dash mentorship, you will get the access to the um, the the payment plan, which is three part and is 175 each. Yay for the sequencing module. Yay, because I'm so excited to share that as well. So I think this is a great program because you can quit learning anatomy piecemeal, one piece at a time. And you get to learn it in this really awesome community and a really supported way from somebody like me who I was intimidated by anatomy as well when I first started teaching yoga. And I kind of went through the, the injury and the recovery, and the physical therapy, and then the graduate school, and now working with patients. And it, I, I really hope to make it so wholehearted and so alive and so wonderful for everybody. So I know everyone is, uh, all of your time is so important. And I would love to know if you have any final questions. I also want to give a shout out to Dan, who just wrote, a, I think, a really sweet comment, which is that anatomy is really important, but caution teachers who are too specific or preoccupied with particular muscles, and they're actually working in context of the whole body, emotions, and mind. Um, and that is so true. Sometimes visualizing a, shock, visualizing a chakra is more beneficial. Yeah. But on the other hand, so many teachers are too vague, and they should get more anatomy understanding. Dan, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you for your kind comments about this webinar, and thank you for just being here. Thank you to everybody, really. I hope to offer more of these. And even if you don't join us, join this program or not, I would love if you commit to studying anatomy. But you can also get a lot of cool information for free from us at yogaanatomyacademy.com. I have a blog up there. I have a couple of pay-what-you-can uh, audio from different workshops that I've done. And I also have a, um, gosh, let me go back one side. What else do I have? I have some free stuff up on our Facebook page too, like a nice conversation there, as well as a Facebook group for people with hypermobility, which shout out to whomever talked about ehlers Danlos because ehlers Danlos and hypermobility are very related. So you're welcome to join that for free on Facebook. 
I'm going to do one quick scan to see if there's any final questions. Awesome, Tiffany. Uh, we can be in touch, and I will be sending out a recording of this webinar. So I'm also going to send a link to the payment plan in the email that I send out. You're so cool. You prayed for a program like this, and then it got created. That's that's pretty rad. Maybe maybe you created it. <laughs> Someone else just writes, thanks so much. Good luck with the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thanks, everybody. Um, so if there are any final questions, now's the time. Last chance. Questions about the webinar, about the program itself that I'll be leading. And I would love to know if, you know, I don't know. I, it, my voice is fading, so let's kind of slip, skip this slide. But, you know, if you learned something, I'll be really happy. Thank you for showing up. I know so many yoga teachers and yoga um, practitioners are taking their studies and their duties seriously. And I know that your time is your, your attention and your time is your currency. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. What an honor. Somebody writes, thank you. Somebody writes, do we have your email address? I'm going to email you out to everybody. So you will if you don't have it soon, and you'll be able to reach me that way. Feel free to um, write and reach. Someone writes, thank you so much for this webinar. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I know this study group's not for everybody. That's totally okay that it's not for you at this time. But that is so sweet that you would pass the information on and to others. Yeah, for anybody who runs a yoga studio um, or you know has a group of yoga teachers that they're close to, feel free to pass it on to them uh, and also to dedicated yoga students who are interested in this kind of thing. I do think it's totally important. We don't get enough in our training. And I have heard of Michelle Edwards and Yoga Align. Thank you for that tip, Chris. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Here's my email address, by the way, John. Info at yogaanatomyacademy.com is one way to reach me. And you'll also get an email in the near future. Thanks to everybody for showing up. Much gratitude. Namaste.